Hello. In this video, we're going to take a look at the definition of inverse function and see how the derivative of an inverse function can be calculated. So according to our definition, you see back in chapter 1, a function has an inverse if and only if for each output value b of the function, the equation f of a equals b has exactly one solution a. Now when this is the case, we use the notation f inverse. That's an f with a minus 1 exponent to denote the rule that links the output b to the input a. So we would write f inverse, this is read f inverse of b equals a. The function f with an exponent minus 1 is called the inverse function to f or the inverse of f. I really don't like this notation, and uh, here's the reason. So don't fall into this trap. If, if you see f inverse of b for some function, this never means 1 over f of b. So never, ever interpret this function that way. It's easy to do because you're used to thinking of a minus 1 up here as an exponent. But with the inverse function, this is not the case. If I wanted to write 1 over f of b and really needed to do that with an exponent, you would probably see this written as f of b, do that calculation first, then raise it to the minus 1 power. Okay. So watch for that. So be careful with this notation. Again, this uh, f inverse, this is the inverse function. It does not mean reciprocal, so be careful of that. In this discussion, we want to keep in mind that b is an output value for f, so it's in the range of f, one of the output values, and the corresponding a value is an input for f that gives the uh, b value back, so the a is in the domain of f. So among other things, this means that if you really want to understand inverse functions, you have to thoroughly understand the domain and range of f. So we'll take a look at a couple of examples to see how the domain and range play an important part here. Let's start with this. Let's let g have domain of all real numbers. That's what r means. And we're going to define g by taking g of the input x to give you x squared. So this is a very familiar function. Its graph is just a parabola. So when you square a real number, you get a non-negative number as the output. And so the range of g, which is the possible function outputs, is the set of all non-negative real numbers, and we denote that. One way to write that is by saying it's a set of all b, such that b is greater than or equal to 0. The function g does not have an inverse function, however. And one way to justify this is to check one of the outputs. Notice if you try to solve g of a equals a squared equals the output 4, there are two possible solutions, minus a and a. So for the output 4, there are two possible inputs from the domain of g. Now, in general, we don't want this to happen. This means that if we were to ask for the value of g inverse of 4, we would not know whether to say g inverse of 4 is minus 2, that's one output that goes with 4, or g inverse of 4 is 2. So this means that g inverse is not a function because a function is not allowed to have two possible answers. When you work with a function, there must be one and only one answer. Another quick test for the existence or sometimes non-existence of an inverse is the horizontal line test. If there is even one horizontal line that intersects the graph at more than one point, then the function whose graph you're looking at does not have an inverse function. So let's go back to the uh, function y equals x squared we just were looking at now. Here's the graph. And we see that, of course, if you take any horizontal line in the upper half plane, such as that one, or that one, etc., these all intersect the graph in more than one point. Of course, the yellow line is a good example here. Okay. So uh, this would mean that this function does not have an inverse, and so the graph of y equals g of x equals x squared with domain the real numbers fails the horizontal line test because any line y equals a squared a not equal to 0 intersects the graph in two points. 
the two-way intersection tells us that the equation x equals a squared has two solutions, where x equals a squared has two solutions. If we want to get an output of a squared, that's up here. There are two possible ways to get there, either from a or from minus a. Now we talked about implicit functions. We talked about testing for uh, whether something is a function or not by the vertical line test. The horizontal line test really is the vertical line test, but just turned on its side. So if we were to take this graph of y equals x squared and reflect it about the line y equals x, we would come up with this picture. Okay? And notice this horizontal line over here that intersected the graph twice becomes a vertical line that intersects the graph twice and it tells us this graph on the right is not the graph of a function. So when we talk about the inverses, these output values up here, so these are the output values that occur along the y-axis, they become input values over here, and for each input here we see we intersect the graph in two points, and so therefore this sideways function is not a function, and that means the, in, the inverse doesn't exist, or the inverse function does not exist. Now, let's consider a very similar function, but with a different domain. Let's look at y equals h of x equals x squared. We're now going to take the domain to be just the set of non-negative real numbers. So not r, not all of r, but just the numbers that are greater than or equal to 0. And notice the function still has range. If you square a non-negative real number, you get a non-negative real number. Our outputs are the same, still the set of all b greater than or equal to 0. And here's what the graph of this function looks like. So we no longer have the graph the complete parabola because we're only concerned with the part where x is non-negative. Now this graph passes the horizontal line test because we, we don't have this left-hand part of the graph here. So when we draw a horizontal line for this graph, it's only going to intersect the graph in one point. So this means for every output b over here, there is just one output a, one input a from which it could have come. So there's the a over there. Okay. So likewise for the line a squared here, here's the output value a squared. Again, if we go backwards, it's only one part from which it came. So this means this function h has an inverse. It's very familiar to you. The inverse, h inverse, is defined by y equals h inverse of x equals the positive square root of x, or the non-negative square root of x. This is the square root that's on your calculator. So your calculator manufacturers have made the decision that they're going to talk about a square root function that is an inverse to the x squared function, but they're only going to use the inverse for the function defined for non-negative x. So that's why when you see a square root, it's assumed to be non-negative unless you're told differently. So notice the only difference between this function h and the function g we look, just looked at was the domain. In particular, uh, it is the difference in domain that leads to this inverse. h has an inverse, but g does not. So if we take a look at the graph of h of x again on the non, for non-negative x. And uh, we can now graph the inverse. The inverse is the square root function. Again, that's a well-known graph. It's here. And you'll notice that those two graphs, the function and its inverse, are symmetric about the line y equals x. Of course, this is the case with all function inverse pairs. The graphs of y equals h of x and h inverse of x, no matter what h is, are mirror images along the line y equals x. So once you have a function that has an inverse, like the y equals x squared graph here, it's very easy to graph that inverse by just doing this reflection about the y equals x line. So I'll take a look at one last example. Uh, the graphical mirror image in, in the graph is a, a very important idea just looked at that fact that the inverse has a mirror image graph. 
and it can give us information about the derivative of the inverse even when we can't find the inverse function itself. Let's take a look at the function f of x equals 2x plus cos x. Now I've only graphed this on a very small part of its domain. Of course, it's defined for all real numbers. You'll find even if you make if you draw the graph for more values of x than we have here, it still stays a one-to-one -one function. So this graph passes the horizontal line test. So this function f does have an inverse. We know how to graph that inverse. We just reflect about the line y equals x. that. And on that reflection, the blue graph reflects into the red graph, and there is the graph of the inverse function. Now, if we plug in 0 to the function f, compute f of 0, we get 2 times 0 plus cosine of 0, that turns out to be 1. And because that means the, the point 0, 1 is on the graph of this function, that would be right there. And because f has an inverse, that means that with the output 1, we must associate the input 0. And so that means that f inverse of minus 1 equals 0, or f inverse of 1 equals 0, and so the point 1, 0 is on the graph of the inverse. And so there's the point down there. So this is for the inverse function here. This is input of 1, output of 0. And notice these two points are symmetric about the line y equals x. So we're going to find the value of the derivative of the inverse function at the point x equals 1. So we're going to compute df inverse dx at x equals 1, or f inverse, big parenthesis, prime at the point 1. So to start this process, we're going to compute the derivative of the function f, the original function at 0. So f prime, we compute down here, is the derivative of 2x plus cosine x, and that derivative is 2 minus sine x. What is the derivative at 0? Well, plug in x equals 0, f prime of 0 is 2 minus sine 0, which turns out to be 2. Now. The uh, derivative is the slope of the tangent, so this means that if we look at the tangent line to the graph of f at the point 1, 0, that's right there, that uh, that tangent line has slope 2. So we, we've sketched that in, in in this particular picture. Now here we've just duplicated the graph again, give ourselves a little more space. And now we've added some new features. We've uh, put a rise and a run for the tangent line in this picture. So we can see here a run of delta a. So we move delta a to the right. We move, we just called it delta b up. Okay. So in this figure, we have drawn the short vertical segment length delta a. And uh, we have put in the analogous rise in the graph, which we call delta b. This is the, the rise in the tangent line. Now we know the slope of a tangent line is given by rise over run, or delta y over delta x. And so f prime of 0, which is 2, which is the slope of the tangent. Well, the tangent's a line, so we can get its slope by doing rise over run, or delta b over delta a. Now why is this important? Well, let's add some more features. If we reflect that green tangent line to the graph of y equals f of x about the line y equals x, it becomes the line tangent to the graph of y equals f inverse of x at the reflected point 1, 0. So we've now done this reflection, and there is the tangent line to the inverse function. And notice when we reflect also this run of delta a becomes a rise of delta a over here, and this rise of delta b, when you reflect about y equals x, becomes a run of delta b for the inverse uh, function tangent, as we see there. Now again, we're going to use these rise over run, which have now been interchanged here, to compute the derivative of this tangent to the uh, 
inverse function. Okay, so uh, we know that the derivative of the inverse function at one is going to be the slope of that tangent line at the point one zero, and that slope is rise over run. Well, let's look back at the picture. What is the rise? We see for this line the rise is delta a. So that goes in here, and the run is delta b. So rise over run gives us delta a over delta b instead. That's the same as 1 over delta b over delta a, and we already computed that down here to be 2, and so this becomes 1 half. So the pertinent point here is that the slope or the derivative of the inverse, which is the slope of the tangent, is the reciprocal of the derivative or slope of the tangent to the original function. And this reciprocal relationship is what relates the uh, derivatives of a function and its inverse. So we'll finish off by summarizing that. And we, if you turn to the top of page 177 of your book, you'll actually see this function or this formula written out. We, not, not quite with all the delta a's, delta b's in it, but here's what we have. We have f inverse prime of 1 is delta a over delta b. We saw that from the picture up here. Again, using rise run to get the graph. That's 1 over delta b delta a, and of course that is the same as f prime of 0. And finally, how do we get 0? Well, we can think of 0 as the input that goes with 1. So 0 is f inverse prime, is, is f inverse of 1. So we get this formula you see at the top of page 177 that says the derivative of the inverse of f, f inverse prime of 1, is 1 over f prime, the derivative of the original function, at the output that goes with 1. Of course, you can go ahead and memorize this formula, but I think if you understand this graph and how the rise of a run becomes a run over rise in the reflective picture, you'll have a much better understanding of how the derivative of the inverse and the derivative of the original function are linked. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'll see you in the next video.